I'd like to welcome our speaker today, Alex Wendt of the Political Science Department at Ohio State, uh, who is going to be speaking on his uh, new book, um, Quantum Mind and, and Social Science. Um, and amazingly uh, creative and uh, daring uh, piece of, of scholarship. Uh, you, you may know uh, Professor Wendt from his uh, award-winning book, in The International Theory, or Social Theory of International Politics, uh, which was named the most influential book of the decade by the American Political Science Association uh, a few years back. <clears throat> and um, before I uh, turn things over to Professor Wendt uh, to make his presentation, just a, a couple of, of quick pointers to those of you who are joining us uh, for the first time on one of these webinars. Um, so uh, if you would like to ask a question, the way to go about doing that is to press the Ask a Question button that you'll see in the upper left-hand side of your uh, viewing screen. Um, and you can submit a question at, at any time. And um, I'll do my best to pass on um, as many of those questions as, as I can during uh, the discussion period with, uh, with Professor Wendt. And um, <clears throat> um, we would also ask that you not use the chat box to submit questions. I mean, if you want to chat with one another, that's fine. Uh, but um, we won't be looking at the chat box um, when we're, uh, when we're uh, passing questions on to, to Professor Wendt. And just one final announcement, um, which is um, to stay tuned for our next webinar, which will be with uh, Professor Stephen Mumford of the Philosophy Department at the University of Nottingham. Um, and that will be in March. And we'll uh, give you the exact time and dates at the end of today's webinar. So um, without further ado, um, I'd like to go ahead then and, uh, and turn it over to uh, Alex. Alex? Um, well, well, thank you, Phil, and, and uh, thank you for inviting me, and also to Margarita and Tim for uh, doing a lot of the legwork organizing this. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm really looking forward to everyone's comments. Um, the details of the book are obviously very complicated, um, but the basic idea I think is actually quite simple, which is that consciousness, and by extension human subjectivity, and ultimately social systems are macroscopic quantum mechanical phenomena. They were, we are walking wave functions is the slogan. Um, I intend this not as a metaphor or an instrumentalist as if thesis, but as a realist claim about what human beings really are. Um, that said, at this stage, the claim can't be proved, um, and so I'm offering it only as an hypothesis or really a conjecture. Um, although in doing so, I hope to show that the rival hypothesis the long taken for granted belief that human beings are classical mechanical phenomena is also a conjecture and a very poorly founded one at that. So rather than try to summarize the whole book um, in 30 minutes, I have decided to focus my talk on really the kind of the front end of it, the philosophical rationale, um, and really in terms of the outline you guys have, parts one through five, because I want to make sure there's plenty of time for questions. Um, and then if I can establish the rationale for the book, that might encourage you, well, first to ask questions about the social side, um, but also maybe to uh, take the argument seriously enough to explore the social implications um, on your own. Okay, so let me turn to um, the causal closure of physics, which is a, the starting point for the entire argument. Um, the CCP is a principle in philosophy. Um, which um, is, proposes that everything in reality, including consciousness and the intentional objects that we social scientists study, are ultimately made up of the elementary phenomena described by physics. So in a sense, everything is ultimately physical in an ontological sense. Now note this does not mean that the social scientific phenomena are reducible in an explanatory sense to physics. Um, Rather, the CCP is an ontological thesis that everything in the universe, or at least everything that has causal powers, is ultimately physical and thus must obey physical law. So ghosts, God, and goblins can't be part of a naturalistic worldview because they have no conceivable physical basis. Now nowadays, the CCP, I think, is taken for granted throughout the physical and biological sciences, 
Um, and within the social sciences, at least by positivists and critical realists, I would think, um, for whom observing the CCP is really constitutive of doing science at all. The situation is less clear, I think, for anti-naturalists in the social sciences, like interpretivists, post-structuralists, and others, who reject the very idea that social science can or should be modeled on the natural sciences. Um, however, to my knowledge, uh, no anti-naturalist has ever argued that theories of social life should be allowed to posit entities or processes that violate the laws of physics. So I think that anti-naturalists, too, at least tacitly assume the CCP as an ultimate reality constraint on their inquiry. The question, however, is which CCP, or what kind of physicality governs social life? Is it the older CCP of classical physics, in which physical equals material in some familiar sense of materiality? Or is it the newer CCP of quantum physics, in which the nature of physicality is deeply contested and might even include mentality as well as physicality. Now, in the social sciences and physics alike, I think it's long been assumed that whatever weirdness was going on at the subatomic level, it mostly stayed down there. And so the relevant physics constraint for us has always been the classical CCP. This assumption, I think, was explicit in the 19th century when the founders of the social sciences looked to what became classical physics for assumptions, models, methods, and so on, on which to build our, the nascent disciplines that we now work in. Since then, of course, social scientists have become a lot more self-confident. We've given up physics envy. Um, but I would argue that classical physical assumptions continue to pervade our thinking. I think actually the clearest manifestation of this is in the methods training we give to our graduate students. When they learn probability theory and its extensions in decision theory and game theory, what they're actually learning is classical probability theory, classical decision theory, classical game theory, not their quantum counterparts where classical axioms do not hold. And indeed, I think this classical methods training is so taken for granted that if you ask your methods colleagues, as I have on occasion, why they teach classical versus quantum probability theory, they probably won't even know what you're talking about because they haven't ever been trained in quantum probability theory themselves, nor have I for that matter. Um, however, I don't think it's just in our methods training um, that classical, a classical worldview is evident in the social sciences. Really, it's, it's all over the place. It's in the computational model of man that dominates cognitive science and economics. It's in our definition of rationality. It's in the dominance of methodological individualism in the social sciences, in the priority many people give to material conditions versus ideas, and to the whole search for causal mechanisms that many social scientists have now embraced. So in short, I think classical thinking actually pervades the social sciences from top to bottom and left to right in a completely taken for granted, unquestioned way. Which is to say, in effect, that the quantum revolution in the early 20th century in physics completely passed the social sciences by. And so in that sense, we are still doing 19th century social science. OK, so part three of the outline. Uh, my claim in the book is that this foundational classical assumption of social science is quite simply a mistake. Um, and as evidence, I want to point to three anomalies for contemporary social science, which I see as symptoms that all is not right with our classical um, heritage, so to speak. The first are what might be called Kahneman-Tversky effects. Um, as most of you probably know, since the 1970s, um, starting with pioneering work by Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, psychologists have demonstrated experimentally the existence of numerous behavioral deviations from the predictions of expected utility theory, which is thoroughly classical in its axiomatic structure. So-called order effects or framing effects in public opinion research, preference reversals, the conjunction fallacy, the disjunction fallacy, and so on. There are quite a few of these anomalies. The experimental, experimental evidence for these deviations is very robust. Um, and basically, they prove, I think, that human beings do not form probabilities and preferences 
in the way that we are supposed to if we were classically rational actors. Now, not surprisingly, these results have spawned an entire industry of scholarship in psych and elsewhere trying to explain our seemingly irrational behavior. But while lots of interesting partial theories have been developed, they are all, I think, essentially ad hoc and without a clear axiomatic basis. So that's number one. The second anomaly I think is much deeper, um, which I would call the subjectivity in the mind-body problem. And by this I mean that human beings are not only objects like rocks um, or glaciers, but we are also subjects with consciousness, feelings, meanings, and an inside point of view, none of which the objects of classical physics have and without which social life as we know and experience it, literally experience it, would be impossible. Now to be fair to social scientists, this is really a problem for the philosophers, where it goes under the name of the mind-body problem, which is how to explain the existence of consciousness in a material, i.e. classical, world. In other words, how can a classical material object, the brain, give rise to a conscious living subject, namely us. Now this so-called hard problem of consciousness has stumped philosophers of mind and now neuroscientists for centuries. Um, and as far as I can tell, they haven't made any progress on it whatsoever. To quote one prominent philosopher of mind, Jerry Fodor, talking about his discipline, quote, nobody has the slightest idea how anything material could be conscious. Nobody even knows what it would be like to have the slightest idea about how anything material could be conscious. So much for the philosophy of consciousness." End quote. And indeed, the problem of explaining consciousness, I think, has become so intractable that many materialists are now concluding that consciousness, and for good measure, free will, and by implication, the intentional objects that we study in social science, are all illusions because they're not consistent with a classical CCP. My attitude toward that is believe it if you can, um, but either way I think throwing out the dependent variable to save materialism is a sure sign of a degenerating research program. Either way, a worldview that has no place for consciousness really has no place for us as human beings, and that seems to me to be deeply problematic not only for social science, but for our place in the universe as a whole. So that's the second anomaly. The last one I want to call attention to, let's call locating social structure. And I, I illustrate this in the book with the question, uh, where is the state? If extraterrestrials were surveying our planet from the skies, they would not see any states or corporations or churches or any other social structures that are out there. They would only see individual people interacting in myriads of ways. Now a common response to this, I think often from realists, is that well, social structures like the state are unobservable entities that can nevertheless be known through their effects. And to some extent I agree with that. Um, but nonetheless I would still say, how so? In the sense that in classical physics, objects are never in principle unobservable. If something can't be seen with the naked eye, then you just put on infrared glasses or get a microscope and then you can see them. But no special glasses or microscopes would enable ETs to see the state. Indeed, even if they could see our brain states, they would not see states. So where are these supposed objects that we call states? In other words, what is the state physically in, in CCP terms? And the problem here, I think, is that the state and all other social structures are really, or at least first, they are states of mind, not material objects at all. And so if the classical materialist view increasingly is that consciousness is an illusion, then it would seem so must be the state and all other social structures. In sum, taking these three anomalies together, I think the bottom line is that in judging a quantum approach, uh, we are not in a Lakatosian situation where we have certain well-established truths and so the only issue is what can the quantum approach add to those truths. Rather, I would submit that these anomalies are sufficiently deep as to call into question the foundations of the entire classical edifice of social science today. And thereby they raise the question of whether 
taking a completely different starting point, a quantum one, might do better. Okay, so motivating, or, or what I've renamed in my outline here, starting a quantum turn. I'm not going to try to introduce quantum theory here. Um, suffice it to say that it calls into question everything that we thought we knew about the deep structure of reality, namely that everything physical is ultimately material, that everything can be decomposed into ever smaller bits of matter, that all causation is local, that subjects and objects are inherently distinct, that the universe is deterministic, and so on. Now, the fact that quantum theory calls these classical assumptions into question does not mean that they are necessarily wrong. Because one of the most interesting things about quantum theory is that nobody knows what it's telling us about the nature of reality. The physicists themselves have been debating for eight, over 80 years what the meaning of quantum theory is. And there are now at least a dozen so-called interpretations of quantum theory, which are basically metaphysical interpretations of quantum theory, that paint strikingly different pictures of the nature of reality. Some salvage some classical assumptions, some salvage others, some salvage none at all. But all of the interpretations, I think, are quite wild relative to our familiar classical baseline. As the renowned physicist John Bell once said, whatever picture of reality eventually emerges from quantum theory, it will surely astonish us. For my purposes, however, the more immediate problem is that most observers and, and physicists agree that quantum physics, quantum effects, I should say, wash out statistically above the molecular level, a process known as decoherence. And so quantum theory is only of real interest at the subatomic level, which is to say at the level of the brain and social life, classical physics would still rule. And it's that assumption that I'm challenging in the book. When I started the book, this was, which is 10 years ago now, um, this was mostly a gut instinct. But the, in the past few years, a remarkable body of scholarship has emerged at the intersection of physics and mathematical psychology that provides, I think, the first real evidence that this hunch is correct. This body of work is called quantum decision theory, and now also quantum game theory. And basically what it does is take expected utility theory and quantize its axioms, allowing decision makers to form probabilities and preferences according to quantum rules rather than classical rules. And here's the kicker. It turns out that when you match up the predictions of quantum decision, quantum decision theory against the experimental data of the Kahneman-Tversky anomalies, the theory predicts every one. And it predicts when these anomalies will not be observed, so expected utility theory is recovered at the limit, so to speak. And it offers quantum mechanisms, if that's the right word, to explain these predictions. And finally, it does all this with a single axiomatically well-founded framework. This seems to me to be an extraordinarily powerful result. And indeed, I can't think of any new theory in social science that has explained so much that had been so puzzling before. And it is really now, for that reason, I think, starting to get the attention of cognitive scientists with multiple special issues and symposia in journals and so on. And now, just parenthetically, we're also beginning to see the dawn of what's being called quantum biology as well, where biologists are finding quantum effects in birds, um, plants, and various other organisms. Now, quantum decision theorists, they're very hard-nosed scientists. I've talked to a few of them. They're not philosophers. Um, and they've been very careful to avoid any claims about consciousness. They don't want to talk about consciousness. And they've been even more circumspect about making metaphysical speculations about the broader significance of their work. So they wouldn't want any part of the argument where I'm going to go now. Okay. However, I'm not a quantum decision theorist. Um, I'm not constrained by their professional um, norms, so to speak. So I can kind of speak my mind more freely. And in particular, I think that quantum decision theory is a key piece of evidence for a much more controversial thesis, namely quantum consciousness theory, which is really two distinct claims. The first is what's usually called quantum brain theory, 
which was developed by Stuart Hameroff and others in the early 90s and is continuing to be elaborated by him and a number of scholars since then. And quantum brain theory proposes that the brain is capable of sustaining a quantum state or wave function, or what's called quantum coherence, at the macroscopic whole brain level. The brain, in other words, on this view, is a quantum computer. This theory is highly speculative and very controversial. It's very much on the fringes of contemporary neuroscience. But with the advent of quantum decision theory and now also quantum biology, I think it's slowly getting more and more attention and more and more uh, adherence. And I think this is what's happening is this is shifting the burden of proof onto the skeptics in neuroscience because they now need to explain how it is that ostensibly classical brains could produce quantum behavior that we observe from quantum decision theory. And I think that's going to be a real challenge for the mainstream view. The other side of quantum consciousness theory is panpsychism, which is an ancient metaphysical doctrine, like materialism, um, which proposes that consciousness is not just a property of human beings or other higher animals, but goes all the way down to subatomic particles. In effect, matter is not purely material, but intrinsically minded. Now that might sound crazy, and actually when I first came across this, I thought it was crazy too, um, but it is a serious position in the philosophical debate about the interpretation of quantum theory. As physicist Freeman Dyson has put it, quote, mind is already inherent in every electron, and the processes of human consciousness differ only in degree, but not kind, from the processes of choice between quantum states, which we call chance, when they are made by electrons." Unquote. Moreover, quite independent of the quantum considerations, after long being dismissed as absurd, um, in the past 15 years there's been a big revival of panpsychism in the philosophy of mind, mainly because of the continuing failure of materialists to make progress on explaining consciousness. And my favorite quote here is the title of a recent article, which is, quote, Panpsychism, it must be true, but how could it be? So in sum, what quantum consciousness theory offers, I think, is a potential solution to the mind-body problem, and by extension, then, the problem of subjectivity in social science, the location problem of social structure, and maybe even the problem of life more generally. Okay, how am I doing on time here? Okay, so I've, I've got a little time. So in the last part of my remarks here, I guess I want to say a few words, although this is more schematic, um, for the implications for social science. Um, and you guys can follow up with whatever questions along these lines, because I'm sure this is where most of your questions will lie. So I'm happy to sort of focus on that in the Q&A. So um, first up is sort of uh, what I call a quantum model of man. Um, and this develops, this is chapters 8 through 10. And this develops the idea that human beings are walking conscious wave functions. Um, and I explore this idea in, in chapters that look at three core faculties of the mind, namely cognition, will, and experience. The cognition chapter basically reviews the findings of quantum decision theory. And the core principle here is that our minds, our beliefs, our desires, preferences, and so on, are not in well-defined, precise states at any given moment, as they must be if our brains are merely classical machines, but rather that all these properties of our minds exist instead as superpositions, which is another term for a wave function, of often incompatible states. A superposition represents a potential, probabilistically, to believe or prefer X or Y, versus actually having X or Y at that moment. Now note, this is not just saying that from the outside we can't predict or know precisely someone's state of mind, although of course that's also true. Rather, the claim here is that like a wave function, people on the inside are actually not in well-defined states at any given moment. What transforms them into well-defined states, what actualizes the potential of the mind, is an, a measurement from the outside, an interaction with some other person or the world more generally. 
And what that does is collapse the wave function of the mind into a particle, so to speak, um, and then you get well-defined states in that moment for that particular interaction. From this kind of framework, I draw two conclusions. Uh, one is that, quote, who we are is not well-defined or determined until we act. And this I take it to be the long-standing message of many feminist and post-structural uh, theorists who have been saying for a couple of decades now with their performative model of human agency that you only become an agent with certain properties when you engage in agency rather than starting to be an agent and then engaging in agency. And the other conclusion is about the nature of rationality. Whereas the kahneman tversky results have traditionally been interpreted as showing that human beings are only boundedly rational, from a quantum perspective, it seems to me that classical rationality, it is classical rationality that is actually the bounded rationality because it is mechanical and deterministic. Whereas quantum decision makers who can take context fully into account and can sort of think incompatible thoughts at the same time in their superposition brains, are in a sense capable of unbounded or super rationality. I then shift gears and look at the issue of free will, and um, I won't say anything more there. This is a complicated issue, and even among the quantum folks, there's disagreement about whether quantum theory supports free will. I make the case that it does, which I think corresponds to our intuitive experience of will. And in this chapter, I also make the case, um, or I address the whole literature about whether reasons are causes. And I argue yes, but not in the traditional efficient causal sense. Rather, uh, reasons or causes in a final or teleological sense, an Aristotelian view of, of uh, causation. And then finally, on the model of man stuff, I address the issue of experience itself, which I illustrate with the experience of time. And I talk about the idea of temporal non-locality, um, and there's some really this was the most fun chapter actually to write. It's maybe the weirdest chapter. Um, I won't go through the argument, but the bottom line is, is that in a certain sense, just as in quantum theory itself, it is possible for human beings to change the past, or at least the past that consists of intentional states, namely our history, our memories, and so on. And not just our interpretations of the past, but literally change the past. The second then core part of the social science side has to do with language, and in particular um, the literature on quantum semantics, of which there's now quite a bit of people applying the quantum formalism to the analysis of language and concepts. Um, and these guys um, are addressing various puzzles in the study or the theorization of language. Um, and in particular, the question of where meaning comes from. And apparently there's a big debate among philosophers of language, some arguing that meaning is compositional, which is built up out of the meanings of individual words into sentences and then paragraphs and so on. Um, and others taking a contextual view that meaning is actually a function of context and is therefore holistic. And what the quantum semantics literature shows, if it's true, is that in fact the latter uh, contextualist view is the correct one. And that's actually, I think, intuitively kind of uh, more sensible anyway. If you read a sentence or a paragraph or a book, the meaning of that sentence, paragraph, or book only becomes apparent at the end. It doesn't get built up one piece at a time as you move along. And the upshot of this uh, analysis of language is that meaning um, is non-local both within the brain, but also then between human beings. And that then leads to what I think is the, the punchline of the book, which is Roman numeral six, number C here, um, which is to rethink the relationship between individuals and society, or what might be called the agent structure problem. And here I'm sort of, sort of targeting the two dominant views. On the one hand, the individualistic view that social structures are reducible, to the properties of completely separable individuals and their interactions on the one hand, but also challenging uh, hierarchical or so-called stratified ontologies, such as the ones that critical realists often advocate, in which society consists of various levels of reality, 
against both of these views, I think that a quantum social ontology, and here I'm building on the analysis of language in the preceding chapters, would be on the one hand thoroughly holistic by virtue of the non-local properties of language. And so our minds, as long as we share a language, are not fully separable. In fact, our minds are entangled in the quantum sense. And that would challenge the individualistic assumption that we are completely separable entities because our minds are actually interpenetrated, even if our bodies are not. And then second, on the other front, against the hierarchical ontologies, the quantum view, I would argue, leads to a completely flat ontology, that only individuals are real in the classical sense, um, and that there are not multiple levels of reality at all. If there are levels, these are merely potentialities within a quantum state space, so-called Hilbert space, but not real in any classical sense. And so what that means is that social structures like the state cannot be seen by our ET friends because they only exist as superpositions or wave functions that are shared by the members of society or the members of that state in their minds. So the state, in other words, is always only a potential reality, not an actual one. Um, okay, I'm going to skip a little bit here because I want to leave time for Q&A. The last point I would make on this analysis of the individual society picture is that where this leads, I think, is to what might be called a holistic individualism, or the metaphor that I develop is that a society is really a hologram in which each of us is a pixel, or a Leibnizian monad, in which the whole is encoded um, in each of our brains, more or less perfectly. And so when social scientists measure the state, or when any of us interact with agents of the state, what we are actually seeing is a holographic projection of our minds, um, which is why the ETs then can't see these states at all, because they're not, in the sense, they don't share our wave function that defines what the state is. All right, just by way of quick conclusion, you know, a lot of people have asked me, although you guys might not, um, why take this quantum argument so seriously? Why not just treat it as an interesting metaphor, as an as-if argument? You know, why assert against the apparent odds that social life really is quantum? And I have to say I've been tempted at times by such a view. It would certainly lighten my rhetorical burden quite a bit. Um, moreover, as long as people are willing to use a quantum perspective, to use quantum decision theory, for example, in their research, I don't really care whether in their heart of hearts they really believe that it's true or not. Just use it and see if it works. That's what really matters. Okay. However, for me personally, it all comes back to the CCP which tells us that ultimately all social life is governed by physical constraints. And so either those constraints are classical or they are quantum. Um, and so in a way I think, and this is really the first time in my career, which is you know, over 25 years now, this is the first time that I've made a claim that I think is either true or false. Either human beings are quantum or they're not. Um, and in a way there's something liberating about making a true-false claim. Um, although, obviously, if I'm wrong, that'll be unfortunate. Um, but for over a century, I think our assumption has been, and never justified, just taken for granted, that the answer to this true-false question is classical. And that has enabled us to build up an impressive body of knowledge, indeed so much so that we now have a good stock of long-standing anomalies, like the Kahneman-Tversky results and so on. These anomalies, though, I think all follow the same pattern which is that they don't make sense given a classical materialist frame of reference. In contrast, if you take a quantum consciousness frame of reference, these anomalies are precisely what we would expect to see. Um, moreover, we arrive at this with just two simple propositions, namely that brains can sustain quantum coherence, namely quantum brain theory, and that matter is intrinsically minded, which is the panpsychist part of it. So in the end, what I'm proposing here is really an inference to the best explanation. Namely, given all the anomalies for classical social science, and given that a quantum social science can resolve these anomalies, why shouldn't we conclude 
that the quantum model is more than just an interesting metaphor, but actually gets us closer to how the social world really is. In short, the conjecture here is that consciousness and social life being quantum mechanical is just too elegant not to be true. So that's the end of my presentation, and um, I'll turn it back over to Phil. Well, excellent, Alex. That was an incredibly thought-provoking presentation. Uh, I wanted to pass on one question to you that came up um, in this regard to your, your interesting um, metaphor of social structure as a hologram. And I was wondering whether you might uh, elaborate on that just just a little bit a little bit more. Um, you know, maybe explain to those of us who uh, don't really quite know what a hologram is, uh, how a, how a physical scientist would think about that, and uh, the ways in which uh, social structure, or for that matter, physical structure, um, is holographic. Yeah, that's good. Um, well, the, I think a good place to start is the difference between a hologram and a typical photograph. Um, if you cut a photograph in half, you lose half the picture um, because each pixel in the photograph only contains a little bit of the information that's in the entire picture. Um, in a hologram, each pixel contains the entire picture. So if you cut a holographic photo in half, um, you don't lose the whole picture. What ends up happening is the picture just gets a little bit more blurry. And as you keep cutting it in half, you'll retain that whole picture. It'll just get a little bit blurrier and blurrier and blurrier. And that gets at the idea that the whole is contained in each of the parts. Um, and so that's, in, metaphorically speaking, and I want to say this is a realist claim, um, the whole here in this case are social structures, and these are contained in each of us, now, albeit imperfectly, because not all of us know all the social structures that are out there. So there's a lot of inequality and so on. Um, but, so, but insofar as something like the state is widely shared as a social structure, it's encoded in each of our minds more or less the same way. So it just is a thought experiment. If some kind of cataclysm wiped out 99% of the members of any given state, you, the remaining 1% could reconstruct that state afterward as long as enough of them knew the basic rules and institutions of that state. Now, the difference with the holograms that we see in the lab, because there are real holograms in, in the lab that, this, that I guess opticians or optical scientists work with, is that you can see those holographic images. The holographic images that I'm talking about here, nobody can see except in the sense that you know, we see states when we measure them as social scientists. Um, and that makes things a bit more complicated. Um, but I think the, the basic analogy, I think, holds true. Um, and I think it's actually quite intuitive, um, as I think many of these quantum arguments are. So, so that'd be my first attempt at a response, but I'm happy to be pushed further on that if you want. Sure. Um, so uh, just a couple couple of very quick follow-ups on this. So um, when you talk about seeing like a state, I'm sure um, many people there um, in our audience uh, think about Jim Scott's book, uh, Seeing Like a State. Mm -hmm. So I would be curious to hear your reactions to that. And a, a second and related question um, would be, uh, you know, as I listen to you talk about uh, the holographic character of social structure, I'm actually um, reminded of uh, Bourdieu's theory of social fields, and also of Anthony Giddens' um, theory of social structuration, uh, mm -hmm. in that both of them um, presume, in some sense, the same thing: that there, that every person carries around, as it were, uh, you know, in their psyches or in their bodies um, or in their consciousness, um, something like a, a picture or a map. Um, of, of, the, of, the, uh, of, of the social world, um, and that uh, this map may be better or worse, or um, you know more fine-grained or less so, depending on a person's uh, position um, in social space or, or or in a social hierarchy. So I'd be kind of curious to hear whether you, uh, if you think that um, there are uh, any 
key differences between uh, the kind of quantum or holographic view of social structure you're presenting here and field theory or structuration theory or whether you kind of regard them as basically two different ways of saying the same thing? Well, I think to take the second question first, um, I do see a lot of similarities with Giddens in particular. And actually, in my previous life, I was a Giddens um, fan. Um, and I think in many ways, the ontology that sort of ends up emerging, so to speak, at the end of my book is kind of a Giddensian ontology. Um, and so I, I see a lot of resonance there. Um, and then one might ask, well, what do you need all this quantum stuff for? Why not just use Giddens? And that's a fair question. Um, I think what the quantum argument does is give Giddens' argument a physical basis and also lots of uh, tools to sort of expand his ideas in interesting ways with quantum decision theory and so on. Now with Bourdieu, I'm less familiar with his work than I am with Giddens. Um, but I, I know enough to know that there are resonances, and especially with his emphasis on practices, because in the quantum framework, practices actually become crucial, because that's where these wave functions collapse and stuff materializes, including states materialize in individual practices. And so the whole practice turn in social theory, I think, um, gets boosted or gets support from this quantum perspective. Um, the difference, I think, with Bourdieu, and here I'm maybe speaking out of ignorance, but my impression of Bourdieu and his followers and many people in the practice turn is that they don't thematize consciousness and that subjectivity in, this, in the experiential conscious sense kind of drops out. And for me, that's really the crucial thing. If we want to put human beings um, into the universe, so to speak, we have to have consciousness. That, that has to be part of the story. And I think consciousness is actually you know, important in lots of ways from a moral standpoint and, and, and everything else. So um, I guess I would challenge the practice term people and followers of Bourdieu to sort of say more about where consciousness fits into the story um, and whether they think a quantum perspective might help them on that score. On the first question about seeing like a state, I hadn't thought about that, but that's very interesting. And actually, um, it's been a long time since I've read Scott's book, but um, I think, yes, I think that's a very interesting and, and plausible analogy. And it makes me think of an example I use somewhere in the book, which is that if you see a policeman pulling somebody over and making an arrest, um, we all know what's going on there, assuming we know what a policeman is and what an arrest is and so on. And in a sense, when we see what's going on, we are seeing like a state because the state is encoded in each of us because of this hologram. Um, so that might be different than what Scott is talking about, which is maybe a state, seem like a state from sort of higher uh, above us in a sense. I think we can see, we all see like a state on the ground whenever we see cops and other stuff that states do happening around us. Um, but I, I would need to think more about that, but I do think there's a connection. Well, I'll just throw out a tiny little teaser for you uh, here, Alex, which is that um, uh, Bourdieu's uh, undergraduate thesis was on Leibniz's uh, monadology, which I know. Oh, I had no a, idea about A big that. role for you. So that's uh, but, interesting. Um, I'm to uh, uh, sh shift the, the, this in a slightly different direction, here's a, here's another question for you. Um, if, if we assume that we do have a shared understanding of the state, then um, how would we go about explaining moments of radical political change? Are these just simply uh, you, you know, things that are out at the tails of a, of a wave function or a probability distribution, or how would we think about those in, in, in quantum terms? Well, I mean, all social phenomena from a quantum perspective are going to be probabilistic and not purely in an epistemic sense that we just, they're so complex we can't know what's going to happen, which would be the kind of a complexity story about a probabilistic social world but in an ontological sense that they, they genuinely are probabilistic phenomena. Um, and, you know, these probabilities will vary. Some, if you think about a military or a well-organized military, the probability that the sergeant will follow the major's orders, you know, is probably extremely high in almost all cases. Um, other social structures, the probabilities are not nearly so concentrated, so to speak and there's more flexibility and more play in the system. Um, in terms of radical social change, 
I mean, that's interesting. And I don't know. I mean, I think that in order to get it, you first need a probabilistic universe. If the universe is deterministic, then radical social change presumably was going to happen all along anyway, um, even if we couldn't known it, have known it in advance. Um, but I do think that one of the attractions of the quantum perspective on human agency is that it accounts very naturally for free will and for creativity. And so stuff can happen and people can do stuff that may be a low probability event in any particular context, but can sometimes set off a chain reaction like we saw with the Arab Spring. Um, so, and again, in, if we're juxtaposing this to a classical deterministic vision, I think the quantum rendition of radical social change is intuitively more compelling. Um, but I haven't thought through exactly how you would sort of have a theory of social change uh, on this basis. I've been more interested in thinking about structure and order than I have been in change, at least so far. Well, um, let me shift the focus here again a little bit um, more. We, we have a number of uh, questions concerning your view about uh, the human person or, or, or the human subject. Um, and one is coming from um, a more psycho, psychoanalytic perspective. So a person is wondering whether um, um, so psychoanalytic theory um, argues that human psychic life is basically ambivalent, um, and this could be seen as similar just to the superposition idea uh, in one sense, but it's also different in the sense that psychoanalytic theory says that there are relatively stable entities within the unconscious uh, that are often at war with one another or uh, with consciousness, the outside world, and so on. Um, so um, do you see this as just a, a, a view that's kind of classical and therefore outmoded? Or um, can you imagine a kind of a quantized version of psychoanalytic theory or, or, of, or of psychodynamics in general? Um, actually, yes. And there, there are a couple, at least two, maybe three or four people that I reference in the book um, who are talking in psychoanalytic terms, and I've forgotten which branch of psychoanalysis they're working out of, but are um, translating that into quantum terms. Um, and actually, there was a political scientist who also is a quantum physicist um, in Florida, Badruddin Arfi, who has written on Lacan and quantum theory. So I think actually it's a very natural combination. And one reason is that from the perspective developed in my book, the unconscious basically is the whole wave function of the mind. And in a, in a wave function or superposition, part of the whole point of a superposition is that you will have incompatible states. And so that um, when that superposition, when that mind is measured from the outside, all of a sudden you'll get one outcome. So you won't have contradictory states emerging. But underneath it all, you will have contradictions. So the idea that the unconscious is full of contradictory elements, uh, repression, and so on, I think makes perfect sense if the unconscious really is a giant superposition, um, which is then being actualized through measurements on a day-to-day -day basis. But then which particular things come out in measurement will be extremely sensitive to context, to the kinds of questions that an analyst might pose, um, and so on. Great. Well, uh, following up on this, this same line of questioning, somebody is, is wondering about um, a, uh, a line that comes up on page three of your book where you say, well, my personal belief that human beings really, uh, my personal belief is that human beings really are a quantum system. And what they're wondering is whether you think that that is an exhaustive explanation of the human person um, or whether uh, that's just part of what a human person is and that we would also need potentially other systems of thought to help us see the full meaning or uh, nature of a human person. Um, hmm. That's a good, no one's ever asked me that question before. So that's, I'm not, I don't have kind of a canned response for that. That's interesting. Um, I mean, insofar as we're thinking in physical terms, so that, and where physical can mean either classical or quantum, 
um, then I would say the mind is fundamentally a quantum entity which collapses into classical states constantly. So all behavior that we observe, and actually our conscious experiences, because they're actual experiences, are in a sense in the classical world. So the classical world is constantly um, being produced or elicited in a sense um, through interactions of our quantum unconscious states. Um, so in that sense, you can't dispense with the classical stuff altogether because that's all you can actually see. You can't actually see the quantum states at all. Um, in addition, I guess I would also say that there, I'm not really quite sure what to do with this part of it, but the human body clearly is a classical object in the sense that it's an actual body that you can see with your eyes and so on. You know, the quantum biology people are now saying, well, actually this body has a lot of quantum properties in terms of its functioning and interaction with the world as well. But clearly there's a classical object there and it can be destroyed by classical means. You know, if you shoot somebody and they die, that's kind of a classical process. Um, so I think in some way the classical and quantum dimensions there too would have to be interrelated with each other. But I think from a social science standpoint, the classical stuff really is just kind of the entree into what's really going on, which is this unobservable, these unobservable phenomena inside individuals or inside systems of individuals, which are creative, can go lots of different ways, they're probabilistic, and so on. And to me, that's where the action is, so to speak. But you need the classical stuff to access that. Okay, great, thank you. So. Um, uh, here's a question that um, is related to both these issues around human personhood and social structures, and um, that is the philosophical question about emergence or emergentism, um, which is usually, usually kind of opposed to some kind of uh, physicalist re reductionism in a classical sense. And mm -hmm. so I was wondering whether you might say a, a little bit um, about where you where you come down on this, um, one side or the other, or um, are you advocating a, a kind of a third position that's, uh, that's beyond either the classical emergentist or reductionist position? Well, this is something that, um, you know, I wrestle with a bit in the last or next to last substantial chapter. Uh, it's an issue that's interested me for a long time, this emergence idea, even in my previous life, so to speak. I've always been a fan of emergence um, and wanting a way to sort of justify it. Um, but in reading the literature on emergence, the philosophical literature, it's clear that there are a lot of problems with kind of a classical, if you start with a classical framework, at least, in an, and you're talking about ontology now and not epistemology or explanation, that it's very difficult to get a genuine emergentist position off the ground, um, especially one that incorporates downward causation and everything else. So, um, and maybe it can be done, but I, I, after reading a lot of that literature, I just thought, wow, this is just a mess. Um, but interestingly, there is a separate um, literature by most, I guess they're mostly philosophers of physics, on emergence from a quantum perspective um, and for them, emergence actually makes perfect sense. Um, and actually, I have a quote somewhere that um, the one place in the natural world where it's clear that emergence happens is in the collapse of the wave function. Um, because then you're getting novelty and something that could not have been predicted um, on any, from any, uh, on any basis beforehand, just kind of popping up into existence. Um, so I think quantum emergence is where I'd then end up with that chapter. Um, and what's interesting about that, though, is that it's not a levels um, kind of metaphor. Uh, collapse of the wave function is consistent with a flat ontology, and so it's emergence within this kind of flat perspective but it's emergence in a sense from potentiality into actuality, and that's what makes it emergent, um, and that's to be understood in quantum terms. <laughs>
Okay. Um, we have some folks who are who are also um, wondering um, a bit about um, the kind of political and normative implications of all of this as well. And uh, one question is as follows: um, It seems that um, so much of the classical social science is attached to a conflict perspective. Um, it's the conflict theorists who claim to be the strongest materialists in the struggle over interest. Um, would a quantum social science decrease the fundamental status of conflict in social? Um, yes, I think so. Actually, um, I think if you know, if kind of the classical view, if we take Hobbes as kind of the um, originator, so to speak, of kind of a classical view on social life. And the state of nature is kind of the archetype of, of how we think about so the starting point for theorizing about social life. The, and that clearly conflict is all over the state of nature. What's interesting about the state of nature is that human beings are seen as completely separable machines um, for Hobbes. And um, it makes perfect sense that they would be conflicting with each other over X, Y, and Z. In contrast, if you have a quantum view, and especially one in which human beings share language, and I think that for me that's a key assumption, once you share language, um, our minds are no longer completely separable. And so in a sense, um, we're not automatically starting in a world where, like in the state of nature, we're all each concerned with only ourselves. There's a quote somewhere in the book that instead of seeing ourselves as engaged in perpetual conflict in this very individualistic way, we're actually all correlated projections from a common ground, I believe is the phrase that this one guy uses. Um, and that's what you would expect from a quantum perspective. So I think from my point of view, um, once you have language in place, cooperation is actually the default starting point. And the challenge then is to explain deviations from cooperation or breakdowns and, and therefore conflict rather than the other way around, which I think is what you get from the classical starting point. And I think if you look at human life, you know, social sociality and cooperation comes extremely easily to us. And conflict is really the exception and not the norm. I mean, at least really bad conflict. Um, so I think just empirically, um, even for someone in IR like myself, um, it makes more sense to see cooperation and sort of communion, so to speak, as the, as the default, um, and there, from there try to explain how things break down. Well, this segues nicely into um, another line of questioning that um, a, couple of people have, a couple of people have raised out there in the audience. And this concerns this um, the sense in which our minds are entangled um, and the way in which uh, language is, as it were, the, the kind of threads that entangle us. And I know that in your book, uh, this has uh, a great deal to do with the, the theory of semantic externalism. So um, perhaps that would be a way of, of, uh, of clarifying that for people. Yeah, I need to reconstruct now what <laughs> semantic externalism was. Um, Meaning yeah, I mean, in the head, as Hillary Putnam said. Yeah, that's right. That's what, okay, that's right. Good, good. Um, yeah, I think that the externalists in philosophy of mind, philosophy of language, have been around you know, at least since the 70s. Um, and their argument, and, and Hillary Putnam had these famous thought experiments. Oh, it was Tyler Burge who had the thought experiments, and Putnam also. Um, who, which basically showed that um, in order to ascertain the meaning of a thought in somebody's head, you have to look at the context in which that head is situated, whether it's the physical context, but more interestingly, the social context of other speakers of that language and who share certain norms and understandings about what is being said and done and so on. And that makes perfect sense, I think from an intuitive standpoint. Um, clearly, we don't all each have our own completely autonomous meaning systems in our head, even if each of us interprets our own meaning slightly idiosyncratically. There is quite a bit of shared meaning. Um, the problem is, how do you make sense of that physically? Because language, just like consciousness, 
must be a physical phenomenon. And so if the world is classical, if the social world is classical, then language must be a classical phenomenon, and therefore it has to be built up out of smaller and smaller bits of meanings. And that's sort of this compositional view of, of language and meaning. Um, and that view, it seems to me, is quite counterintuitive. Um, and whereas if you go the quantum route, and, and, and the compositional argument makes it very hard to justify externalism. It leads really to an internalist perspective on meaning, where it's really all in the head, um, which is still around as a view is my understanding, but I think the minority view. Um, so the quantum argument, I think, provides a physical foundation for semantic externalism. And then the question is, well, do we need to really go read quantum physics to then go be semantic externalists? And well, maybe, maybe not. It depends on what your purposes are. I think there is value in thinking about it. And, and the people who do quantum semantics do some really interesting and cool stuff. Um, and so it's definitely worth checking out their work, I think. Um, but yes, this would be a, a physical grounding or justification for semantic externalism and for the view that minds, in a sense, are interpenetrated as a result of that. Um, so I, I guess one thing that, that another people, number of people have asked, too, is whether this um, opens up the possibility that our minds, our consciousness are entangled in ways that go beyond uh, language or objects, right? Um, whether there might, after all, be something to this uh, sort of strange experience, this sort of kind of uncanny experience that people often have of, um, you know, thinking of somebody and five minutes later the phone rings. You know, we're pitching off into. Uh, kind of that's um, yeah, I mean, I don't address this in the book. I have, I think there's one reference. Um, but there is you know, quite a substantial literature on um, well, what's called parapsychology, which includes a whole variety of phenomena which are very difficult to document. Um, Daryl Bem at Cornell has done very provocative and controversial work um, that you know, supports some of these claims. Um, and from a quantum perspective, um, once again, these phenomena, if they are eventually documented, would make perfect sense. Um, whereas from a classical perspective, it's inconceivable that such things could happen. Um, there's work, for example, on um, people can sometimes tell where they're, when they're being stared at, even if they have their back turned, right? And this, this work is actually fairly well established and so on. And so there's a sixth sense kind of stuff going on. Um, and I think that would be presumably has something to do with entanglement that's not semantic or linguistic. It's something else. And what that is, I'm not sure. Um, and actually, this kind of question gave me fits at various points in writing the book because I kept thinking, you know, there is a difference between, on the one hand, minds being interpenetrated through language, and on the other hand, um, genuine telepathy where we could read each other's thoughts and experience each other's thoughts in our own heads, in a sense, as if they were one. So there is some kind of difference there. Um, and I don't know how to, to parse that difference. Um, but it is interesting that there are quite a few people who think quantum theory can help us make sense of parapsychological results. Um, so, but I haven't followed up that literature in much detail myself. I figured that was a bridge too far for a book that was already pretty far out there. No, that's right. I have no doubt in my mind that uh, the viewers <laughs> would have zeroed right in on that. Yes. And I've been very, very quickly, right? No question about it. Went has lost his mind. You, know, you, yeah, that's right. you, can, already, you can already imagine. Um, well, let me ask you, here, here's a sort of re related question. Um, slightly different. This is a bit more a, a, a kind of a structural question. And so you talk a lot about non-locality, non-locality, um, mm -hmm. right? That, um, that causation in the social world and um, a fortiori in the quantum world is, is can, can be, maybe often is non-local. Um, and mm -hmm. just wondering if you could say 
a little bit more about um, what you mean by that, how that how that would work, that something that's uh, very distant in time and space um, could exert causal effects um, that would be uh, non-local. Yeah, no, I think um, there are two kinds of non-locality. Typically there's kind of spatial and there's also temporal non-locality. Um, on the spatial side, the example that I use and I think is, is helpful, um, well actually Master Slave is also a good example, but more concrete one is the case of Socrates and his wife Xantippe. When Socrates is forced to drink the, drink the hemlock and he dies, she becomes a widow. And her becoming a widow is not a causal process in the traditional mechanistic sense where one billiard ball hits another and then another and another or some kind of transmission of force. She becomes a widow by definition in the community of ancient Greece um, because they had a concept of husband and wife and so on. Now clearly there has to be some kind of transmission of force or communication from the people who were witnessing Socrates' death to everybody else on the outside and then for her to eventually find out that she was a widow and so on. And so there is a, a causal process but the, uh, in the traditional sense, but that's very much consistent with what a lot of the, or at least some interpretations of quantum theory advocate, which is that on the one hand you have this kind of non-local process that transcends space and time, and, but that's coupled with the more traditional process as well. Um, in some peculiar way that I couldn't tell you right now because basically everything I know is in the book <laughs> and so I have to go look it up in the book sometimes before I know what I'm saying. Um, so I think that the, the sense in which she became a widow is a non-local process. Now that may seem trivial, but again, one has to ask, and this is the question that I'm asking throughout the book, what is the physical basis of her becoming a widow? What is the physical basis of the, the meaning of that term? And that, it seems to me, is much harder to explain in classical terms than in quantum terms. Because actually, if classical materialism cannot explain consciousness, then it cannot explain meaning, it cannot explain language, it cannot explain basically anything in the social world except the most crude behaviorist um, phenomena, the stuff the ETs would see if they were monitoring us, basically. So for all the things that we kind of take for granted, about intentional life and language and meaning, all that stuff could only exist in a quantum world, at least on my uh, reading. And there's a similar argument about temporal non-locality and changing the past too, um, but um, I think I probably should pass the ball back to you and see where you want to go. Sure. Um so I, this raises some interesting questions about the way in which we should we should think about causation. So um, you know, I think you stress um, on many occasions in the book that um, follow, if we, if we following the, the classical picture that, that social scientists tend to think about causation in terms of what Aristotle called efficient causation. You know, basically. Um, one little small hard particle whamming into another and trans transferring energy to it. I mean, you know, all of the diagrams that we use uh, to put up on the blackboard to talk about causation are, are like this. Um, and obviously, you're you're not happy with this. Um, this is, in fact, you know, your the talk is sort of trying to push us beyond this. And yet. Um, you know the the sort of the new gold standard supposedly is causal mechanisms right which All right. Uh, just doubles down on a kind of a mechanistic picture of how the world works and so um, I, I'm wondering how where you come down on this I mean uh, do we need uh, a sort of a plural, more pluralistic understanding of causality like Aristotle's um, maybe not the same as but pluralistic or uh, do, should we get rid of the idea of causation altogether and replace it with something else, or um, none of the above? Um, where, how, how do you think you should think about causation in the social world? Yeah, that's very interesting, and that's a hard question, um, probably because um, 
you know, the book is self-consciously focusing just on issues of ontology, and causation is at least partly kind of an epistemological problem, and I've thought much less on that side of the equation, so to speak. But I do have a few thoughts. Um, it's, I guess, first I would say that um, I'm very sympathetic to an Aristotelian sort of fourfold framework. And there are some quantum people who think that's also a very fruitful way to talk about different kinds of, of quantum processes. Um, so that might be one way to go. Um, secondly, though, in, and interestingly, um, apparently in physics, they never use the language of causation anymore. It, the term is viewed as redundant or as kind of um, pre-modern or metaphysical or something like that. They don't, it's not invoked. They don't talk about causal mechanisms in quantum physics at all. Um, so that gives me, makes me a little bit wary about, well, if social life is also quantum mechanical, maybe we don't need a concept of causation either, presumably, if the physicists don't need one, since they're our most advanced science, presumably. Um, and there's an interesting edited volume that Hugh Price and uh, I think his last name is Corey did on conceptions of causation in physics and where the physicists come out on this. And there's a whole debate within physics about the status of ca causal concepts. And a lot depends, of course, on what you mean by causation. And of course, that's, there's no agreement on that, even among um, mainstream philosophers. Um, in terms of causal mechanisms, you know, I am very skeptical if that phrase is understood in the way that you described it as kind of billiard balls and transmission of force and all that kind of stuff. Um, but interestingly, quantum mechanics, the word mechanic is right there in the phrase. So um, even in the physicist's world, there is a sense in which this is viewed as mechanical. Um, but it's clearly not mechanical in anything like the old-fashioned mechanistic sense. Um, and I think actually in many ways the term quantum mechanics is really a misnomer more than anything else, and it's kind of misleading in that respect. Um, so what one would, would replace causal mechanisms or causation with is I'm not totally sure. I think non-local causation um, is clearly very important. Um, there's this literature on so-called Cambridge changes, which is the Xantippe example I gave a minute ago. And my guess is that those kinds of changes are pervasive in social life. Um, and there may be some kind of a ca traditional causal process that subtends or underwrites what's going on there, but doesn't fully account for it because you need the quantum dimension to fully make sense of it. So there may, this may be a case where the ca classical and quantum um, physics need to come together, in a sense, to make sense of what's going on. But um, I do think this is an area where much more could be said than I said in the book. It's a, um, something that I think is just really needs to be explored. Um, and again, always being attentive to what is the physical basis then of causation in the social world where the objects we're talking about are intentional objects and not material objects in the old-fashioned sense. Great. Well, um, I'm a big theory and philosophy nerd. You obviously are too. Um, mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the folks out in the audience as well. But, um, you know, many of our colleagues don't and share our enthusiasm. You know, they, all, they always want to know more about, uh, as it were, um, what happens when the rubber hits the road. So um, I'm just curious if, if you would like to offer some thoughts or um advice um, about um, how all of this would um, would help us to do better research uh, in international relations and political sociology or whatever whatever field we happen to be working in. Um, hmm. Well, I guess I would say a few things there. I think um, partly what needs to be done is to train a generation of graduate students in quantum methods. Um, because by teaching our students classical probability theory and classical decision and game theory, we're really training their minds to see the w social world in classical terms. And that creates then various conundrums and, and anomalies that wouldn't even be there if they were seeing the world in quantum terms. And the quantum math is so unfamiliar. I remember when I was at Chicago first getting into this stuff and I had an economist friend who was in the department with me in political science, a very smart guy, you know, very high-end math skills, 
and I showed him a quantum game theory paper, and he couldn't read it because the math was so unfamiliar. It wasn't that the math was so hard. Apparently the math is not that hard. It was just completely unfamiliar. So I think um, training students is step one so that they can start to, in a sense, see the world in a quantum way. Um, secondly, I think um, it's also one way that I've, some of my own students have asked me similar questions. You know, well, if I want to do this, what do I do? Um, and I think one thing that one can do is to look at existing social theories or theories of international politics, whatever they might be, and zero in on particular assumptions of those theories that are clearly classical assumptions, and then trace through the work that those, that assumption is doing in the theory, the causal work, the inferential work, or whatever it is, and then think about, okay, if we replace this assumption with a quantum axiom instead, how does that change the predictions of the theory? How does it change the logic of the theory? Or the kinds of normative implications we would draw from the theory? So it would be kind of a search and replace kind of strategy, looking you know, at particular assumptions in our theories that are clearly classical, and doing a lot of work but are taken for granted precisely because they're part of a classical metaphysics that is completely in the background um, when we actually do social science. Um, and then I guess the last thing I would think about is um, one area that I think is ripe for exploitation is you know, the quantum decision theory people have done a huge amount of work now you know, showing how their theory predicts the results of the quantum and diversity experiments and so on. What we have not yet had, as far as I can tell, is an analogous um, movement on the game theory side because also in game theory, experimental game theory and behavioral economics, we once again have many, many anomalous results. People don't play Persian's Dilemma the way they're supposed to and so on and so forth. My prediction is, or my expectation is, that if you match up the predictions of quantum game theory, which are different than classical game theory, they will explain all those anomalies in behavioral economics and experimental game theory. So someone should come along and bring those two literatures together. But that hasn't happened yet, and my guess is that will start happening in the next few years. So for anybody who has mathematical skills, and, and especially quantum mathematical skills, that would be a very fruitful way to immediately establish yourself as a major figure in the field, I think. Great. Well, so um, just to kind of push this line of questioning a little bit further along, um, so um, let's imagine that um, five years from now you're asked to rewrite uh, your social theory of international politics into a quantum theory of international politics, as it were. So how, how does that how does that change um, how does that change the theory? Um, well, I, I hope to eventually um, write volume two of this project, which would be applying this framework to IR. Um, so I haven't figured out what that's going to look like yet. So in that sense, it's a hard question to answer. Um, in some ways, you know, it, the, my first book, The Social Theory of International Politics, was an attempt to develop a, a very much an anti-individualistic, pro-holistic view of the international system. Um, and in that respect, the quantum argument simply allows me to double down on that and say, yes, this is a holistic system with all the standard holistic properties that master-slave relations and everything else have that we're all quite familiar with. So in some ways, I think it would not change the theory at all. Um, on the other hand, um, the, my first book did have kind of a levels um, view of emergence. Um, and I would need to rethink that in kind of a flat ontology, and in particular, and here I would go with someone like Colin White, who's an IR guy, maybe he's in the audience, um, who's been a critic of mine, but I think I agree with Colin on this now, that states maybe are not the relevant actors anymore. It's really all about individuals. And when we talk about a state, what we're really talking about are individuals that are embedded in a certain kind of wave function that we call a state. Um, and so individuals become the unit of analysis much more than states are. And I think that's interesting theoretically, also normatively, um, and would probably result in a pretty substantial shift in, in the way 
my sort of first book, The Arguments Cashed Out, which was in many ways a very mechanical kind of framework. Um, and then I guess another big difference might be on the epistemological side. In that book, I had a different, you know, I was trying to reconcile interpretive and positivist epistemological moments. Nobody was satisfied with my resolution. I wasn't satisfied with it. And I think part of the problem was that um, consciousness just didn't figure um, in that book anywhere. Um, and without consciousness, you don't have meaning, and you don't have anything that the interpretivists care about, and so on. So now I would write the book um, with consciousness much more front and center. So the experience of international politics, whether by leaders, by citizens, um, by whoever, would actually be maybe a central question as opposed to something that at least in contemporary IR scholarship is totally at the margin. When IR scholars talk about war, hardly anybody except feminists and a few others care about the experience of war. But actually, if, without the experience of war, war isn't even really war anymore. Um, so I think that would be another direction. I think it, there would be normative differences too, normative implications that I haven't even begun to think through. Um, so it would require a lot of rewriting. Oh, the last thing I would say there too is that at the end of the quantum book, I make the case that the state is an organism. Um, and there's a very interesting work in philosophy of biology now on what exactly is an organism, what is an individual. Turns out these things are highly contested. The biologists themselves don't know what an organism is. Um, and my expectation is that a quantum perspective would offer some insight on that. And I have a PhD student, um, very good one, Sebastian Mainville, who's doing a dissertation thinking about the international system as an organism or a superorganism. And my hope is that he'll, his dissertation will he'll get the argument to work and that I can build on that and think about the international system as a sort of a quantum superorganism and sort of take off from there. So and that I think would have a lot of implications for change and development and so on that I have barely begun to think about. But so it would involve a lot of rewriting the book. <laughs> I'd probably write from a totally different starting point and then start it from scratch. Great. Well, so let me uh, just to sort of uh, to wrap things up here a little bit. Um, so your, your your first book was all uh, at least in part inspired by by critical realism, and in in your new book um, you advocate what you call a kind of open realism. And so I was just curious if you um, could say a little bit about um, you know what parts of critical realism you know, you would and wouldn't take on board now and how you see this open realism as, uh, as being similar to different from uh, the critical realism that you embraced earlier? Um, well, I think in many ways, I mean, I'm still a realist, I think. Um, even the open realists, um, and actually another phrase I just came across, there's a, phys a philosopher of physics, uh, phys physics named uh, Christopher Fuchs who has a really interesting take on quantum theory. And he, he has a phrase, uh, participatory realism, which I quite like also, um, which I think captures many of the same connotations anyway as an open realism. I guess for me the difference, so in one sense what I would retain from the traditional scientific or critical realist um, way of thinking is that, yeah, that there is a world out there um, and we can access that world in, in, to some extent. Um, it's not an idealist kind of perspective. It's not a solipsistic one. There is something outside both in the material world and of course other human beings. Um, and the purpose of science, social science, is to try to get at that and, and that we can get at that at least to some extent, although it would be now probabilistic because it's quantum. Um, the open, though, and participatory part of it is that I think, and this would be the difference from the traditional or critical realist line and really closer to a more post-structural line, um, is that social scientists themselves, um, when they measure states or whatever it is that they're measuring, they really are helping to co-constitute those objects um, in the process of measuring them. And there's actually an effect in quantum theory um, called, I oh, don't know, what is it called now? It's, uh, I just lost the term. It's not a quantum eraser. It's, um, oh, it's, well, there's a, 
there's a phrase and there's, there's an effect where if you measure something again and again and again over and over and over again, it stabilizes its properties and makes it almost essentially classical. And it seems to me that that's how we make things like the state um, stable because you've got millions of people in any given state all measuring the state every, in their interactions with police and tax men and so on every single day. And those constant interactions stabilize the wave function that is the state. And social scientists are just as much a part of that process as everybody else. Um, so in that sense, something like the democratic peace, and I have a brief example of this effect in the book, um, is not some phenomenon that's out there in the world completely separate from social scientists, but rather both social scientists and decision makers, by thinking that there's a democratic peace and in a sense measuring it in certain ways and performing it, are in effect helping to create the very object that they are analyzing. So there is a sense, and this is true in quantum theory across the board, there's a sense in which the measurement and therefore the measurer is a, is a in some way, and this in what way is contested, but in some way a co-participant in eliciting whatever classical outcome arises. Um, and I think that's, that's a difference with the traditional critical realist line as I understand it, um, and a really a, more of a participatory epistemology that feminists and post-structuralists, I think, have advanced for a long time. But oh, still scientific. Yeah. Indeed. Indeed. Well, thank you so much, Alex. This was uh, incredibly interesting and, and stimulating, and um, I wish we could go on and on. There are uh, questions about actor network theory and the new vitalism and the new materiality. Oh, yeah. That's one of my favorite things to talk about, but yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Alas, we'll, we'll have to we'll have to leave that all leave that all for for another day. Um, or uh, you know, I encourage folks out there to uh, to pick up um, Alex's book. It um, even though it, it sounds intimidatingly difficult, it is very clearly and uh, and accessibly written um, and does cover subjects like this. So many of the answers to your questions you'll you'll find uh, you'll find in the book. And um, just uh, as you can see on your screen, our, our next webinar uh, will be uh, with Stephen Mumford, and that will be at the end of March. So um, if you enjoyed this, please tune in for that one again. And um, thanks so much again, Alex, uh, for taking the time to uh, discuss your, your new project with us. Well, it's my pleasure, and thank you for all the excellent questions. And, and by all means, if anybody has any thoughts or questions or criticisms or comments, or whatever, I would love to get an email from you, and I'm happy to go back and forth as much as I can. This is clearly an evolving project. I've really just begun this journey, even though it's 10 years in now, um, in thinking this through. And this, this is really a first step, even just for me, f far from a last word. And so I would welcome any additional advice or input that anybody might have. But thank you for having me on the show. Very much so. Sure, sure. And uh, you know, we'll schedule your next webinar for February 19th, uh, 2026. <laughs> All right, Alex, be well. All right, you too. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye.